oh, terrifying. In fact, so much of my family tried to talk me out of it, even after I'd created the Oak Journal and started doing public speaking and you know facilitation. Um, multiple people in my family that I respect were, you know, well, you, you can't sell Zen, man. You can't stop doing that. That's been, all, you know, basically all you've done your entire adult life once you stopped assisting. Support for this show comes from Exit Factor. Exit Factor offers a proven method that helps small to mid sized business owners maximize their company's value. Through one to one consulting services and online programs, the trusted advisors at Exit Factor teach entrepreneurs how to successfully navigate and fully leverage strategies when buying, building, and selling their companies. Participants that follow the program have experienced considerable results, with some increasing business value as much as 57% in one year. It's time to start running your business every day like you are going to sell it. Learn more at exitfactor.com backslash pod. Now enjoy How I Sold. Welcome to How I Sold, presented by Exit Factor. Only 13% of all businesses in the U.S. are sold, but we only hear about the billion-dollar stories. Here we explore the real-life stories of entrepreneurs and business owners like you that were able to build, grow, and sell their small businesses. Now, here is your business exit expert, number one best-selling author and host, Jessica Fiakovich. Welcome to How I Sold. I'm Jessica Fiakovich, and I created this podcast after spending over a decade in mergers, acquisitions, and exits, and noticing that we often hear the stories of the unicorn sales. You know, those companies that are valued over a billion dollars. We don't often hear the real life stories, the stories of thousands of entrepreneurs every year that build, grow, and sell their small businesses. These are their stories. Today on the show, saying yes and adding value. Keith Roberts, a creative entrepreneur, shares his journey of building a career and a company in an arena he had no experience in when he first started. Today, we hear how he built and sold one of the top web development agencies in Colorado, Zenman. We talk about how saying yes and keeping your mind open to opportunities can take your life and business in the direction that it was meant to be. Welcome everybody to How I Sold, where we tell the stories of real entrepreneurs and how they built, grew, and sold their companies using their resources, bootstrapping, and everything that they had available to them. So I want to welcome today um, one of my really good friends, and we've known each other for a number of years now, Keith Roberts. He is uh, was the founder of Zenmen, which we're going to talk about today, but we're going to also talk a little bit about your journey, your new journey with Oak Journal. Keith, welcome so much, and thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Jessica. Yeah. So um, why don't you start? I gave a little bit of background, but why don't you tell the audience in your own words who you are? Like, What is your bio today? Uh, so my bio today is very different than my bio when I started a company. My bio today is I do public speaking and I'm an author and I created a tool based on positive psychology and neuroscience to help everybody reach their full potential and be the best version of themselves. But if you rewind 35 years, which I literally just did this weekend. I had my 50th birthday party and had this incredible gift of my two best friends sitting with me. And Delroy Gill asked the question, um, what did you see each other doing You know, when you were 15? And my dream was to be a professional photographer. Um, it's all I ever wanted to do. I went to Brooks Institute of Photography. I have a degree in undersea photography and industrial scientific photography, which was really limited. I could work for like JPL, NASA, or the Cousteau's. Um, and I ended up assisting for a couple of years. I worked for a guy named Bob Carey, who's a photographer, and then Vic Huber, who at the time was the top car photographer in the world. So I, I'd reached um, seeing the pinnacle of what I wanted to do in my professional career. But there was this crisis among photographers. The years that I was graduating from Brooks, stock photography was becoming a thing. And so in the past, if you wanted a picture of you know a man and a woman shaking hands in a conference room, you were paying two models, you were hiring a location fee, like that photograph and alone might cost thousands of dollars. And now you can get them for pennies or free on the internet. So as I was sort of coming up, the entire industry was was dying. 
and I spent a year as a starving artist. I actually spent my entire savings to have my first art show and made this much money. Uh, so then I had no savings and had to get a job. So I, I literally, the week unemployment ran out, uh, I knew I still wanted to be in creative services. So I started looking at design work and <clears throat> truth be told, and Caitlin hates when I say this, but I lied on my resume. I said I had these skills. And then when I got the job, I spent the weekend at Barnes and Noble because I didn't have the cash to buy the books to learn the software. So I literally went, um, cribbed some notes down in a composition book and went on my path to design. And in design, I realized really quickly there was a, a much bigger demand for. And within six months of uh, starting to do that and then starting to do some freelance work, I realized web design paid three to four X what graphic design paid. So I jumped into that 25 years ago, which was truly the wild west of the web. Yeah. I mean, I, most companies probably didn't have a website back then, right? No. In fact, when I first started, I used to, uh, most companies didn't, and I would drive around. Uh, I only had experience in like two industries. One was developers and the other were like DJs. I would drive around at apartments or new developments and call the, uh, loft complex or the apartments and say, Hey, I'm interested in moving from New York city to, which is funny because I had a 303 phone number. Um, and you know, do you have a website so I could check out your, uh, units available, they would say, no, I clearly knew that because I just drove by and saw all the signs and got the phone number. And I would say, I'm not interested. You know, let us send you the floor plans. No, no, no. If there's not a website, I'm not interested. And then after a few months, they would potentially um, hire me to do their website. They would get a phone call from a different person. So um, it was very guerrilla when I first started um, and just truly the Wild West. The aspect ratio was 640 by 480, which is so much like a fraction of our cell phone today. Um, but it was, it was a really fun time, um, for the first few years. Yeah. And I, I want to get all into that, Keith, but, um, I want to, I want to jump back and explore your story a little bit, even before the photography. And one, I mean, one of my favorite parts of your, your story and your journey is the photography, cause you are a very talented photographer and we'll get into sharing some of your Instagrams and stuff, maybe at the end of the show. Um, but tell me a little bit about, you know, where you grew up and, and you mentioned you wanted to be a photographer, but did you grow up in a household that promoted creativity, entrepreneurship? Like what were you kind of cultivated to be as you were coming of age? I'd say. Um, this is another very embarrassing story, but seventh grade, I thought I could game the uh, placement test. And so I thought in my mind, a 13 year old Keith, um, that the machine just scanned to see what bubble was filled in versus what was not filled in. And so I filled in the entire uh, sheet, every single A, B, C, D, E, F, which actually took exceptionally longer than just doing the freaking exam. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I was put in uh, like the lowest, uh, like two plus two is set for, you know, five plus two is seven. I was put in beyond remedial uh, classes and my mom had, a real serious conversation, heart to heart saying, Hey, if you try really hard, you know, any school you want to go to, even if we can't afford it, <clears throat> we'll find a way. And like a week after being in that class, the, the gig was up and I had to retake the test and they moved me to AP classes. I should not be there. Uh, but my freshman year in high school, I took photography. So two years later, I took a basic photography class. And I remember the first time I developed a photo, seeing that paper turn into a photograph in the developer was magic. Um, fell in love. The next year I started going to vocational school and that professor gave us an opportunity for, I think it was 11 of us. We got to tour Brooks Institute of Photography in Santa Barbara. So, you know, growing up in the desert in Phoenix, Arizona, Santa Barbara, it's still to this day, it's my favorite place in the world. Campus is on the hills in Montecito overlooking downtown Santa Barbara. And they have this undersea program where you live on a boat and dive and take photos of whales, dolphins, nudibranchs, um, sharks. It was incredible. And I pulled that, well, mom, you, you said it wasn't that they didn't encourage creativity, but that was my ace in the hole that like you said, I could go to any college if I could get in. Uh, this is where I want to go. And my parents made huge sacrifices to the budget. It really wasn't in alignment with their finances, but they, they made it work. And 
I never took that for granted. I actually was able to place out of a couple of classes and save them a couple of semesters of, of, um, of dues of registration. But that for me was a, a pivotal part in my life. And it's also where I found Buddhism. Yeah. Yeah. Which I would definitely want to talk about that too. I do love, um, the seventh grade story though. And you gaming the system, it's almost like, um, it's kind of like an inner introduction to the entrepreneurship trait of, right. How do you, how do you play <laughs> the game to win <laughs> instead of like just taking this test? Um, but I, I love how that frameworks. And I, I love the support that your parents gave the journey through photography, through Brooks. Um, super interesting. I mean, I think we hear the stories so often about, and this is related to the photography business, but we hear the stories so often about the music business and how that shifted drastically uh, with the introduction of Napster and everything. But I mean, photography really went through the same thing and even a leap forward to today. And now everybody is a photographer, right? With their freaking iPhone. Um, and I, I think it's not an industry that we talk about a lot, but it's probably been reshaped more so than even music even the medium that we use. I mean, I romantically, if you've been to my house, you know, all the antique cameras I have and my Hasselblad and I still have 35 millimeter film cameras and it's rare that I shoot film. It's, it's kind of sad, this dying medium. And, you know, I'll, I'll probably never print a photograph again because it's so much easier to use the digital tools to get the results you want. Whereas, you know, printing traditional method with an enlarger and light and dodging and burning. And it just, you know, it took Ansel Adams a year to make one print once. I mean, it's definitely a work of art in that time time frame, but yeah. So, all right. So let's jump back into now you have um, over-exaggerated on your resume, we'll say. Yes. <laughs> You've got yourself <laughs> into yeah. this now creative, <laughs> yeah, uh, creative space into web development, really, really leading in that industry. What made you decide that you were going to go on on your own, you were going to start your own company. What was that impetus? It's actually something I'd always wanted to do. You could literally go back to seventh grade. Apparently that was a very pivotal time in my life. And I remember my economics teacher explaining the definition of an entrepreneur and the way that it, you know, in 1984, when I was in seventh grade, the way they explained it was people that take high risks that extreme high probability of failure, you'll probably have multiple bankruptcies in your life. It was repellent to everybody else. And I was like, oh, that, that resonates with me. Like, you tell me I can't do something? Well, hell yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And so I had this goal before I turned 30 to have my own business. Um, when the company that I exaggerated to work for hired me, uh, within about nine months, I was promoted. And then they were acquired by Equifax. So I was in Southern California. And they moved me here to Denver. Uh, my plan was only to stay here for two years. And after they moved here, I started doing some freelance work and then there was some consolidation. I actually decided this is an opportunity. I said, I'll take a voluntary layoff and I started Zen Man full-time. So start with Zen Man full-time. What kind of resources do you have? Like what, did you have a large bankroll? Like how did you get the company off the ground? So it was actually the severance. The nice thing about that time was the economy was still pretty solid and I had a high roll. So I had, um, I think it was three months severance because of my, my tenure of a few years and my position. And then I just thought, you know, if I can't make a go at it now, I'll never make a go at it. So, uh, took the package, never applied for another job and just started really pounding the pavement aggressively guerrilla marketing. I was so bootstrapped when I started the company, I had to find a printer that would do trade for design to print my business cards. So, I mean, the, the most minimal bootstrap company you could imagine. I love trade. I wish we could go back to that. I don't have a business anymore that we can really like trade services, but I mean, trade can go a long way when you're getting started, right? Absolutely. And, you know, the work I've done with, you know, restaurants that, take exceptional care of me and anything they need. I'm always there for them. Um, but I think that applies to everything, you know, karma. If you have, it was one of the core values at Zen Man was perpetual karma. And if you apply the same ethics and, and approach to business that I did in my personal life, it paid out. But you know, the literally only resource I had was a desktop computer underneath the stairs in my one bedroom apartment in what was not Rhino at the time. It was absolutely the hood. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was uh, for those unfamiliar with Denver, it was not 
the hip city that everybody wants to live in now, um, back in those days, right? <laughs> Where I lived, there was no other residences. It was all very, very industrial and addicts and crime. So it was, but it was the only place I could afford. I had this disillusion when I moved from San Diego, I'd be living in this amazing loft downtown. And then I realized very quickly when I got here, this is like the same price as living on the beach. Yeah. Yeah. A couple yeah. blocks from the beach. Yeah. <laughs> there you, yeah. San Diego is so expensive. So starting Zenmen, who, who's doing this with you? Are you doing it on your own? Do you have any business partners, anybody supporting you in the launch? No, it, it, the launch, it was just me. And that was actually one of the challenges was the the cycles of I'm selling, I'm selling, I got a bunch of work, I have to do the work and I'm not selling. And I finished the work and I have nothing lined up. So it was very much and always one of the challenges in running an agency that doesn't have recurring revenue. Um, you know, when you're project based every month is eat what you kill. And it was probably one of the most stressful parts of that business. And it was quickly until I started hiring, you know, we would, were doubling every year. And then when we started adding employees, my personal income plummeted and it took another half a decade to build it back up. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's funny in, in businesses like that, where you like transactional will call, you know, you can have these roller coaster rides of high highs and low lows and you get stuck in the cycle. So it's, it's very difficult and not every business, actually most businesses, you can't take to recurring revenue right off the bat. Right. So a lot of, you know, the businesses that we'll we'll talk about on this show and talk about on Main Street, like you have to go out and eat what you kill and hunt and and sell and I, the guerrilla marketing tactics type stuff that you were talking about earlier. Yeah, whatever it took because it was definitely feast or famine, and it had a profound impact on my personal happiness to the point where, in you know, in the thick of Zen Man, I couldn't laugh. I'm just telling a story earlier to somebody today of a uh, I went to see Seinfeld and. Everybody around me was just, you know, laughing hysterically. And I realized that something's wrong. You know, I'm not even smiling. And uh, it was just the stress and the weight of, you know, the responsibility, the overhead, the, you know, multiple families that depended on me being able to kill what they could eat. Yeah. What, um, so what point in the business was this? Like, how many years were you in when you hit that kind of? lull the not being able to smile it was probably years six through 18 or 19 so honestly the lion's share you know once once we started scaling and and as we scaled um even when we we got to the point that we were doing you know frontiers website and working with remax and the lumineers and really a-list clients um my overhead had grown so much and there are only so many of those projects going on. So we almost scaled ourselves into extinction, which was pretty uh, mortifying. And also the, the sort of galvanizing moment to start Bigfoot, which was our, our sister agency uh, that did more affordable work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so some of the milestones, and you just like rattled a few of them off, but like you obviously you added employees, you scaled, you you got bigger clients. What were some of the important milestones for you as the owner? Were, were, was it stuff like that or was there things that you achieved along the way that made you more proud than just the basic growth metrics? Um, I mean, there were, there were a few milestones that were, have sentimental value, right? The first year we did six figures. Um, I remember that. I bought myself a Mont Blanc pen to commemorate it. Um, qualifying for EO was a big deal. Um, it's funny because now I have two of those pens uh, because I need to give one to each of my, my boys. Um, <laughs> and I don't remember which one's the original. Um, hitting a million was, was a big deal <laughs> in that it allowed me to join EO and joining the entrepreneurs organization for me personally was where I learned how to actually be an entrepreneur. I think the first 16 years, I was just too stubborn and would do anything to not fail from, you know, calling and lying and saying I was interested in buying an apartment to try to get you to, you know, do a website to working, you know, 90 hours in a week when I had pneumonia in one of my lungs and, um, you know, forced them to check me out of the hospital, um, not realizing actually how dangerous it was. So really would push to do whatever. But when I joined EO, learning about traction, EOS, scaling up, you know, understanding how to 
be an entrepreneur and how to run a business instead of how to just do whatever it takes to survive. Yeah. And do you think that, I, I mean, I'm not sure where that lines up years wise, but did that help with, you know, so, sort of that, I'll put words in your mouth, but that burnout that you were experiencing with the overhead and the stress and the anxiety about the company and the growth? No. So it, it, it gave me an understanding uh, and it was actually the program at MIT, the Entrepreneur Master's Program, where I had this epiphany that I need to stop trading my time for money. Um, you know, we at this point, you know, I did EMP. It was six years ago, so uh, 19 years into running Zen Man, uh, you know, my hourly rate is that of a pretty exceptional attorney that you would hire at a Boulder to do an M and A, but I was still trading my time for money. And so I made this conscious choice that I was going to stop um, investing in this business that I'd spent two decades building and make a conscious choice to abandon that sunk equity for the, the future life that I wanted to, wanted to have. Yeah. Scary decision, right? Oh, terrifying. In fact, so much of my family tried to talk me out of it, even after I'd created the Oak Journal and started doing public speaking and you know facilitation um multiple people in my family that i respect were you know well you, you can't sell zen man you can't stop doing that that's been all you know basically all you've done your entire adult life once you stopped assisting um photographers that's dumb that's too risky you know it's it it grew also but you know now i'm getting you know twelve thousand dollars to do a keynote talk in the bahamas um it's very different than um, just the grind of before. So you're making that conscious choice to release it. But my family would say, well, what happens if you only did, and at the time I was, was 5,000, but what if you only do one, one talk a year, then that's not a sustainable business. It was very, um, the opposite of, you know, don't follow your dreams. Don't try to do this. Don't, um, don't pursue it. Go the safe path which again was the opposite of what they told me when I first started the business. You know, my dad was an engineer. The safe path was you go to college, you become a, you know, an engineer, and then you have this stable future. And uh, not for me, uh, funny, Delroy, our mutual friend in EO, Colorado, he was here for my birthday party. And very late in the evening, we got into my vinyl record collection. And he said, I want you to play a song for the start of the next half century. And the song was My Life by Billy Joel, uh, because very much like, you know, you can speak your own mind, but not on my time. Go ahead with your own life, but leave me alone. I, I have my own path and I believe in it. And I'm happy in it and I love it. Um, so, and I don't uh, want to change or influence anybody else's. Everybody's path is theirs and I respect that. Yeah. Yeah. I, it is, it is interesting, you know, you, you start on this entrepreneurial journey and it is risky to start your own business. And then, you know, you're 18, 20 years in and now your, your business is your safe path, right? Um, it's, it's an interesting flip of how, how the family was, was thinking of supporting you at the time. So now, you know, you're basically, and I, I remember this, this point, you're running two businesses, right? You still got Zen men going and you're, you're launching your speaking career in the Oak Journal. You know, what was, why did you decide that exit was the right time or what, what propelled that decision for you? Was there some planning and preparation or did it just happen one day? The exit was serendipitous. I had actually made the choice that I was really scaling back the agency. I'd let most of the employees go. I had an opportunity to go on a speaking tour in Asia and, uh, one of Mindy, my partners, um, her mindfulness teacher actually had a nightmare that I drowned. And she reached out to Mindy and said, hey, I need to talk to Keith. I called Celeste, uh, set up a meeting, went and talked to her. And she said, I had this vision that if you stay on the path you're on, it's going to kill you. Um, but you have this opportunity in, uh, in this trip, in this speaking tour. And I think if you embrace this, um, you know, I see nothing but abundance and happiness and, and truly having an impact on people's lives. Um, so when I went to Asia, I said yes to everything. Um, didn't do any agency work for three and a half weeks and the world didn't stop. Everything went on fine without me. And, uh, that was the shift. And when I came back, it was, you know, really, it, I wasn't just like turning the lights off, but in all honesty, it was a dimmer switch that I was really slowly 
turning down. But there were a lot of clients I've had for two decades, like the Bananos that have become good friends. And I didn't want to leave anybody without um, a solution. And, and that's when the the acquisition presented itself. And it was synchronicity. Um, I met Danny Solden, who was the founder of Blue, at Machu Picchu at an EO Leadership Academy. Again, EO, the reason for the, the sale that existed. Um, Danny reached out to me and said, hey, I, I want to buy a company in the US, an agency to expand. And I started saying, hey, here's some good ones that you should look at. I, I wouldn't look at these companies. You know, I should Google lawsuits against company X. And uh, he said, no, I'm, I want to buy your agency. Um, and it was interesting because they, had that crossed your mind when you're doing not that all. research for him? Had it crossed your not mind? Not at all. I had no <laughs> idea he was talking about my agency. But what Danny wanted was, you know, we had a trust, and he knew we had a reputation, and it helped us, uh, us now being in blue, expand into the U.S. So it, it helped um, me with a soft landing for all of our clients, so nobody had to scramble to now who now who supports our website. Now it was going to you know help with the UX of the app or the brand. Um, and it was very much a win-win, which was the amazing um, synchronicity in that. So, you know, it actually happened really, really quickly. I remember calling you and, you know, Stan wrote up the, the contract for us. And I think within 45 days, the acquisition happened. Um, and then, uh, you know, I had a year earnout, um, which was awesome actually um the only thing i'm disappointed in is because of covid i didn't spend months in south america most of our offices are buenos aires bogota colombia peru mexico um but i'm still on as a consultant so maybe we'll get some trips coming in 23 yeah was that that was probably one of the more attractive uh areas of the deal is being able to explore down there a little bit oh love love absolutely love that and it was just um honestly going with the flow of life um everything, everything will work out and everything, um, you know, if, if you follow your path, if you, you know, do the hard work, I don't believe that you can just wish upon a star and manifest, you know, a billion dollar exit like a Sarah Blakely. But if you, you know, put your nose to the grindstone and it took me two and a half decades to have an exit and it, you know, it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a Spanx exit or a Brad Feld exit. Um, but it was a, it was a good exit. It was I got to buy this new house exit. I got to live um, my icky guy, which is to be a bodhisattva. Um, if you don't know what that is, I'm a Buddhist. A bodhisattva is somebody. This is not for Jessica or re listening. Um, bodhisattva is somebody whose purpose in this incarnation is to help others reach enlightenment. So now doing the speaking, um, I feel like I get to touch people's lives in a way that's not selling them a frontier ticket that they don't realize they're going to have to pay for baggage, their seat, and all these other things. Um, so it much more feels like it's my purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I do. I, I like you brought that up too, Keith, is that you, there was a serendipitous spiritual component to this path and this exit for you, but also you didn't just wish upon a star. I mean, this is a t two decade business, nose to the grindstone, guerrilla tactics like you started out with, like you you worked your ass off to get to the business to where it was. It wasn't just, you know, I'm going to manifest this exit and it's somehow going to appear, but there was a component to that. And I, I think that's the interesting part of your story is that those two fields, whatever you want to call it, kind of merged together at the right time, the right place for you. When we come back in just a moment, how saying yes to opportunities created not only this exit for Keith, but a second exit as well. More on that second exit and how Keith created a second business from clients that he was turning away. Stay with us. I'm Jessica Fiakovic, and you're listening to How I Sold. Support for this show comes from Exit Factor. Have you ever wondered if your business is sellable? The truth is, Thousands of businesses sell every year from just a few thousand dollars to billions. Now, there are a ton of experts that will teach you how to start a business, more on how to grow one, but only Exit Factor will teach you how to build a valuable and efficient business that is sellable at any time, no matter what happens. Visit exitfactor.com backslash pod to learn more about us and take our free assessment to find out if your business is sellable. That's exitfactor.com backslash pod. 
Hey, welcome back to How I Sold. I'm Jessica Fiakovich. We're with Keith Roberts, founder of Zenman. Keith built his web development agency from scratch with grassroots marketing and sales to be one of the top known agencies in Colorado. He has just put together a deal to sell Zenman, but now a new opportunity presents itself to sell its sister agency, Bigfoot Web, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I am I am leaving no stone unturned in this life in seeking, but things the stars absolutely did align like they like they were supposed to. And ironically, wouldn't have happened without Finn. That trip to Machu Picchu without our, our mutual friend Finney and Kelly, you know, he he pushed me to go on that, which was a bucket list trip for him. I would have never met Danny Solden if I hadn't just said yes. And that was post the literally right after the trip to Asia where I had you know, from Celeste said, all right, I'm just going to say yes to opportunities and see where it goes. And, uh, ironically a year to the day of selling Zen man, I sold Bigfoot to another EO -er that I met saying yes to somebody that came from South Florida and reached out and said, I want to meet other EO -ers, other entrepreneurs for a coffee. Um, the other thing I think factors into that is I very much try to add value you know, I mean, my, my earnout is over. It's been over for a few months and I'm still contributing because we haven't reached the goal that we set out 18 months ago. And, um, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to make sure we get there before I ride off into the sunset. But, um, it, that's just the core value of mine. That is, you know, it's, it's my word. It's what I was going to say I was going to do, but there were trials and tribulations and struggles along the way. And there were more tough times exponentially than easy times. Yeah. Which is very true of all entrepreneurial journeys. And you, you know, something you just said that, that we talk a, a lot about with exit factor is the, the most important outcome for you um, when you're exiting your deal. And you mentioned it earlier, but you wanted a soft landing. You wanted a good home for your clients. You, you had some really big name clients, but who had also become close friends, good relationships. And um, I can see through your exit that your most important outcome was was their placement. And still, like I, I see you to this day on LinkedIn helping with M Blue and promotion and hosting different events, and that's very very apparent. Um, and that's not that's not always the case with all exits. But am I right on that? Was that the most important outcome for you? Um, oh yeah, keeping my word. Right. That's that's. I hate the term personal branding. Um, that to me, a personal brand is, is, is bullshit. Um, your reputation and your word as a human, if I say I'm going to do something, whether I do it or not, that's what matters. Not your Instagram or, you know, how many, um, LinkedIn endorsements you have. Did, did I say I was going to do, or did I deliver, or did I exceed your expectation? Yeah, that's very true for you. All right. So before we jump into like after and learning, I do want to touch on something, um, because during your time with Zenman, I think you you cr created one of the the best, most creative growth strategies that I've seen with Bigfoot, and we kind of brushed over that. And I just oh, would yeah. love, you to, <laughs> yeah, I'd love you to tell the audience of how you came up with Bigfoot because I think it's it's a lesson that we could turn into a lot of our businesses. So, what? Just tell us the story about how Bigfoot came to be out of Zenman. Yeah, um, thank you for asking. So, Bigfoot in i think it was 2015 or 2014 we had you know been doing the the enterprise client work but when i first started the business we worked with small mom and pop size shops restaurants you know small practice uh, uh doctors and we got to the point where it was fifty thousand dollars for us to do anything uh, and it wasn't profit it was overhead right the team that i needed to build a cypher frontier you know at one point our overhead was close to 200,000 a month, uh, not quite, but approaching it. And what we realized was the smaller clients that could no longer afford us, I was sending to other great agencies like Stuart Relish and some other shops that could do the work. But one year we sent about 900,000 in, in jobs to other people and I thought that's dumb. Um, so we decided to spin up a sister agency that had, you know, literally under the same roof, but a different team um, that could do things in a much more um, economical way. But with one of the values at, at Bigfoot was big brand knowledge. So from our, you know, our big brother agency, Zen Man, we had the skills, the knowledge and the processes in place 
to deliver exceptional work quickly. So spun up Bigfoot Web, um, and then those two companies were running in parallel. Again, legal entities, but under the same roof. And then, uh, again, serendipitously, because I was still, you know, would get the occasional call, and I'd let all the staff go. So when the occasional call would come in, that would be me jumping in and doing work. Um, so opportunity presented itself. Uh, Peak 7 is the agency that we were acquired by in uh, South Florida. They live in South Florida, but they're called Peak 7 clearly because of the mountains here in Colorado. It's one of its favorite places. Um, so they acquired Bigfoot. And now, this is so cool, we were just at TEDx, and Bigfoot was one of the sponsors. The TEDx is a client of theirs now, and seeing a brand that I created on uh, such a big name stage that I didn't do anything. You know, we they didn't pitch him. I didn't talk to him, didn't do any of the work. It was actually a really cool moment to see. Yeah, that is, I mean, it's, it's surreal almost, but I, I wanted you to share that story too, because I remember, I mean, we met right around the time when you had just spun up Bigfoot and I just thought it was such a like simple aha approach to growth. And then, and then look, you know, you got two exits out of it, ended up on the TEDx stage just for recapturing some of that revenue that you were referring out. So I, I wanted to make sure we got that story out too, because that's, that's a really cool creative journey. So let's jump back into the exit. And one of my favorite questions to ask people is, what did you do after? So you sold Zen Man, like, you know, this is something you've been doing for a couple decades. Now you do have the focus of Oat Journal and, and speaking and everything like that, but what did the day after look like? What the month after look like? And you know, now you're a year and change ahead. Like, what's changed? I laugh a lot, which is awesome. I really appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> I was very intentional. I mean, the day after, I was jumping in. I was ready to like, how are we going to hit these goals? How am I going to hit you know the the milestones that I needed to hit and the KPIs to make sure that at the end of this, everything was a win win uh, for the acquiring company and me financially. Um, we, I was very, very concerned about losing my identity. I'd heard so many stories, you know, like our mutual friend, Aaron, who has a, you know, nine figure exit and the day or month after is, uh, depressed and struggling, uh, from, you know, tech companies to, you know, the founders of snooze. I talked to them and one of those brothers regretted selling snooze like the day they sold the company. Um, and it was a big exit. And, and I think they're still have, you know, they're wetting their beak in that. So it's not about the money. Um, that's a big piece of it. But those are some great examples to show how you can go from a good place to a bad place when you actually reach your goal. So I was very, very aware of that. And I mean, the company was called Zen Man because when I started it, it as this Buddhist dude knocking out websites under the stairs, I was the Zen man. Um, so I went to Joshua Tree with one of my best friends, and we had a, uh, a psilocybin journey under the stars. We camped out, we had a campfire, and I had this uh, ceremony where I actually burned my last Zen Man president business card to have this transitional, you know, okay, that was a chapter in my life, and now I'm intentionally stepping forward to the next chapter. Um, and I feel incredibly blessed, one, because of the team, the culture, and just the way M Blue has supported me. Um, but also, I think, because I have been was intentional to disconnect my ego from my, the, the brand that I no longer owned, um, I never hit that depression. I feel really, really grateful for that. And it's only because I learned through other people's experience shares that I need to be really intentional with this, this uh, transition. It's such an important lesson. And I think sometimes in the entrepreneurial community, we focus on the more tactical and strategic decisions we're going to make towards an exit. But the reason I ask about the after is because uh, my first exit, my husband and I also went through depression and a, a really dark period. Um, but the fact that you were aware of that, you learned from others, not mis mistakes, but unawareness and had something scheduled, not just to transition, but also celebrate. I, I see a lot of people that they don't celebrate. Um, and something we'll talk about on this podcast a lot is only about 13% of all businesses are sold in the US. So 
it's, it's pretty, it's a huge accomplishment to even go through an exit. And I think a lot of us take for granted and don't have that celebration or that transition moment to what's next. The, the transition moment was awesome for me and really important. And another thing, this is going to sound like a 13 year old kid, but I, similar to that pen that I got when I, the first year I did a hundred thousand um, dollars, I bought my Hattori Hanzo Katana. Uh, so I have uh, this traditionally forged gorgeous um, Japanese Katana. And that's my memento of like, this was the result of Zen man. This is the, um, the win from the hard work. And I'm a big fan of, commemorating special moments right i had a have a bottle of uh, i don't drink but i have a very special bottle of port that the bananas gave me for my 40th birthday that was i think 1813 it was pre-civil war and so it was really awesome to share that bottle of port with my eo forum the month i sold zen man and i'm a big fan of you know the good wine is not meant to be saved it's meant to be savored Today is a gift. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. And, you know, this is a special moment to be treasured. Um, and I think too many people wait to embrace those opportunities or special moments and save them for the future when, you know, today is a gift. Yeah, it, re it really is. Nothing else is guaranteed in life. And, you know, why, if you can't celebrate today now, you know, why are we doing any of this? Right. So before we jump into our final question, what, how did your exit journey? change your future like what did you learn from it what have you done anything different the one thing that i would have done different is i never really prepared the company for an exit so you know i had a good i had a good exit i get to stay in eo which is great so there's a milestone number there that is clear but you know if i had built the company from day one with the expectation or goal of an exit um it would have made the exit much more profitable for me <clears throat> and it would have reduced the pain throughout the 24 years that I was running the business because the things that make a couple company more um, attractive for acquisition as well as you know increase the multiplier are the things that make the company more profitable and you know make the the owner um, compensation more beneficial. So there's definitely some things you know one would have been to focus on recurring revenue services really early on. Um, and then the second piece would be, I wish I would have realized what I didn't know much, much earlier in life. Um, you know, I didn't know what EBITDA was until I'd been running a company for 15 years. <laughs> That's ludicrous, like ludicrous. Um, the other thing I would say is your CPA and your attorney, you can't pay them enough money. You know, uh, my CPA is, is pretty good. My attorney is a rock star and he saves me money. Um, and we'll still chime in, um, you know, randomly on a group text. If I make a comment, you know, like, Hey, come over for poker, you know, I'll show you guys the katana, like that's a liability. And this is documentation that can be used in court. Stan is joking, but he's always <laughs> looking out for me. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what, Keith, I will tell you, it's not ludicrous that you, you didn't know what EBITDA was. It's, you know, I think why only 13% of companies are able to exit is because, you know, 87%, like they just don't, don't know. We have our heads down. We're, you know, like I said um, at the top of this podcast, like we are not, we're not telling the stories of people who have billions and billions of dollars they've raised to go spend. Like we're, we're in this, we're building these companies and, and we're doing everything or the chief revenue officer, chief marketing officer, chief janitor, right? In our companies. And it's, it's hard to pick your head up and, and see the light sometimes. Yeah, it's very easy to get stuck working in your company and not on your company, which I know sounds like a cliche, but that really is a game changer where you can step out of the forest and actually see the trees. All right. I lied. So we're going to do one more question before the, your final um, wrap up quote that I'm going to ask. I want you to tell everybody, because what you're doing at, actually, this is a great pivot, but what you're doing now really helps people pick their head up. And I, I want you to share a little bit about what you're doing now, um, your calling that you spoke about a little bit earlier, and then also wrap in where people can find you if they want to learn more and interact. Absolutely. So uh, that EMP program, I I did made that conscious choice, stop trading time for money. So what is a product that I could create? And I read this really interesting article about uh, companies that follow Kickstarter and Indiegogo, and they see products that have a ludicrous demand 
and then they will beat those people to market. It'll be a factory or somebody that can manufacture something quickly. Um, I did not want to steal anybody's idea. Again, perpetual karma is one of my core values, but I saw a couple of journal products that um, had similar techniques to the structure that I have, but not exactly the same, like the 10, 10, 10 morning routine from Warren Rustan, um, daily gratitude. And I thought, you know, with my design skills of running an agency, I can, I've designed books before I've laid out publications. So I built the Oak Journal, which is a 90 day journal based on positive psychology and neuroscience to help everybody reach their goals. Um, and I started, you know, printing these and gave them away to my EMP class that led to the speaking tour in Asia. And it's really been, you know, a flywheel that's just started moving with more and more momentum. So Oak Journal is what I do now. Um, it's interesting because I really thought I wanted to just make this journal and sort of wake up in the morning and look at my phone and see how much money I made when I was sleeping. But what happened was the public speaking. And now it's, it's actually been such a gift. I love helping other people reach their full potential. My why is through science, spirituality, and gratitude to help others be the best version of themselves. So when I get to you know, speak at MGM or the CEO conference in the Bahamas or to <laughs> the basement health association at the, con you know, cr uh, concrete con, which is a big conference in Las Vegas or, you know, the uh, Ho American horse association, everybody, no matter what you do from, you know, basement um, insulation guy to an equestrian to an entrepreneur, they want to be happier. You want to be more productive. You want to live your best life. The the first slide in my keynote is a number one in 400 trillion. And that's actually the statistical probability that you have a life. And that number is just the, the number of eggs a woman is born with times the number of sperm a man will produce in his lifetime. The odds that you exist, not factoring in there were 6 billion people on earth roaming around that had to come together to conceive each of us that once they were together, one in a 400 trillion chance. So it's such a a miracle that we exist. Um, and then the second slide is uh, a quote, what if your last day on earth, the person you became met the person you could have become. And so it's about understanding um, what a gift this life is, what a miracle that we've won the biological lottery and to not take it for granted, you know, that they, as a Buddhist, and I see this with, with people in my family and with friends, there's lessons that we are supposed to learn in each life. And if you don't learn those lessons, then we're forced to repeat them. And I, I like to think that some of the harder lessons um, means we're closer to reaching that enlightenment. But I see people that are going to be repeating that same pain and it's, it's heartbreaking, but it's their journey, not mine. Yeah. You can't, you can't put other people's rocks in your backpack. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Put your own oxygen mask on first, all of that stuff. My Oak Journal's right here too. So, and I've been using it God, every, every day since I think you launched it. I remember before you launched it and you used to have um, your own notebooks where you would scribble out for every day, your gratitude, your focus, your, and, and everything that you had put into the Oak Journal. Um, so I know it's been, it, it's been, a, I wouldn't even call it a game changer to say it's a life changer um, for me and a lot of other entrepreneurs, even for our leadership team. So, um, but watching your journey too, from your exit to this, where I see a lot more life, um, and you and excitement around this new chapter, um, I'm very excited for you. So if people want to learn more about Oak Journal or order some for themselves, their leadership team, what's the, what's the best way that they can get those? Two ways to get hold of me, oakjournal.com and then keithroberts3.com. There is a really famous science fiction author and then a rock star. I think he's in Alfred's McGee. Um, so I'll never have KeithRoberts.com, but Keith Roberts 3, I'm the third, is how you can get a hold of me uh, for anything. And then amazingly, they let me keep the URL Zenman in the acquisition. It's very funny to see like Zenman's no longer a part of it. And Stan actually told me, and I will curse for this. I don't normally curse. I said, Stan, can you, in the negotiations, try to... Uh, see if we can keep the URL. Um, I just finished a book called Becoming Zen Man. Again, it's like people know me as that and Stan's exact words were, there's no fucking way, but I'm happy to ask for you. 
And when Danny heard, he said, uh, do you want to do another agency? I said, no, Danny, I have a book. It's called Becoming Zen Man. And he said, that's a, that's a great name. You can have the, the domain. So in six months, um, I get that back and can start using it to promote myself. But you can always do Keith at zenman.com forever. It's that whole, if you don't ask, you never know, you know, who, who knows? Like if you didn't ask, you probably could have kept it the whole time, but you just wouldn't have known. So exactly. All right. Yeah. Um, before, yeah, before we wrap up, my fr- final question for all guests is if you could wrap your entire story, your entire entrepreneurial journey into one quote or one piece of advice, what is that? I would actually just say, this is from our most recent Supreme Court justice. Um, somebody asked <clears throat> her a life-changing moment. She said there was a moment in law school where she was walking and her head was down. And another woman, another black woman walked by and she just said, persevere. And that one word inspired her to keep going. And there have been a lot of nights <clears throat> where I wanted to give up panic attacks, months where I lost a quarter million dollars and didn't know how to tell my wife. And uh, yeah, persevere. I love it. Thank you so much, Keith, for joining us on How I Sold. I can't wait to continue to follow your journey. Obviously, we're connected in so many circles, and I'll be able to continue to do that. If you're listening, definitely check Keith out. Uh, We'll drop all that contact information into the show notes if you want to connect with him more. Thank you so much, Jessica. It was an honor. Have a wonderful day. That's Keith Roberts, founder of Zenman. I've learned so much from our conversation and from Keith's journey. And I can't wait to see his journey with Oak Journal and his speaking career for years and years to come. Hey, thanks so much for listening to the show this week. If you want to support us, spread the word by subscribing on your favorite podcasting app or YouTube. You can also leave us a five-star review and post about us on social media. We really do appreciate it. If you'd like to learn more about How I Sold or apply to be on the show, go to howisold.co. I'm Jessica Fiakovich, and you've been listening to How I Sold. Thank you for listening to How I Sold, presented by Exit Factor. Please follow us on your favorite podcasting app so you don't miss an episode. Another way to support the show is by leaving a review. Find more information about How I Sold and Exit Factor, including how to be on the show at www.exitfactor.com slash howisold.com.